Um, so that's the fun part of my job. I also teach for the University of Arizona's iSchool. So I teach in a program called Games and Behavior, and I teach game-based courses. So I do a course on gaming and information cultures. I do a course on, um, oh, what am I even teaching? Instructional technologies, of course, you would expect that one, but I also teach a course on um, gamification in society. And all of my courses, as you can expect, have a gaming component to them. And so my goal today was to take you through some games that have been created in other situations that I've been in, um, but also kind of bring everybody together because we're all very smart people and we're all obviously very interested in games. Um, and to kind of make a platform for us to talk about ways that we can use games in interesting situations in our classes. And so of course, I know a whole bunch of us are here because we all love this really amazing game called Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and some of us might not know what that is. So to bring us all to the same level, when I'm talking about Dungeons and Dragons, what I'm talking about, they call them tabletop role-playing games or TTRPGs. They're usually played in person, but of course, like everything else, most of these have been moved to online situations. I actually have a group that I've been playing with for about eight years now um, that we've, we've never met in person. I have no idea what any of these people look like. We play completely online on a program called Roll20. And usually Dungeons and Dragons is two players. It can be, I've played a one-on-one -on -one game before. It could be one player, there are solo games, um, but it's usually two or more people playing a game together where one person is guiding a story and the other person is interacting with that story. You get to kind of choose who you're going to be, choose their background story, kind of figure out how they're going to interact with this world and what type of attitude they're going to have or what kind of knowledge they're going to have. And you use your character sheet. So there's a sheet that tells you all the cool things that you could do and all the stuff that you're carrying, which usually doesn't make much sense to me because I always play little women who are carrying like a hundred pound pack. And I'm like, that would not be fun. Um, <laughs> and you go through this campaign and usually the story is kind of laid out unless you're playing what we call a homebrew game, a game that lives all in your DM's mind. And most of the time those aren't written down and things take weird turns. And when you wanna do something, you roll a dice to see how well you do it. So that's where you see what we call our beloved D20. Um, and there's a picture of one in the upper right hand corner for those of you who have never seen one. So basically it's collaborative storytelling. And for those of us who have played around with little kids or have been in classrooms with children who really enjoy storytelling, a lot of times you'll play those games where somebody starts a story and the next person tells it. D&D is kind of like a highly interactive version of that with hopefully an end goal. And so before I get any further, I'm going to ask you all, and I'm gonna copy this. See, this is why I don't go into, kind of throw this over here. There we go. So there is the main sheet that I use. When you click on it, you should be brought to something that looks like this. Um, think of this as your player's handbook for the next hour. as we all flood in. The most important section you're going to need for the next like hour is going to be right here in presentation links. And here's where you're going to get access to the practice game, to the character sheet. If you don't have a D20, really <laughs> pretending to be adults. Yes, very much so. Actually, I pretend to be a kid. Sorry, if you don't have access to a D20, um, Google actually has you, <laughs> has got you covered. You want to just click roll and it rolls it. It's kind of amazing. Um, yep, Google roll a D and a number and it'll roll. There's a D2. So if you need a coin flip, there's a D4 if you are doing some kind of damage. So first thing we're gonna do is take a take a look <laughs> at the practice game. So I know a lot of people haven't used a software called H5P before. So I created a really fun practice game so if you will, click on the link for the practice game and click, it'll be called TP Practice. 
And it should redirect you here to this very amazing RPG person who is wearing level one armor. And how H5P works is once you start the course, click on the button, you can navigate from screen to screen by clicking this proceed button. Oh, it looks blue to me. <laughs> and then you get a, uh, a choice. Most of the time when we're using a D20, it'll give you number ranges. And if you roll your D20 and you get a number that fits in the top range, you go for it. If it's a number that fits in the bottom range, you click on that one. So I'm gonna say, yes, I'm ready to go with my D20. I'm gonna roll my D20. Welcome to the world of 900 tabs. My D20 gave me another five. It hates me. That's cool. So I rolled my D20. I rolled a five. So I'm going to click here as well. You know, first rolls are tough. And I don't want to try again. So I'm done. I promise the next game we play is going to be longer than this. So do I have anybody stuck, lost, confused? Oh, Christy got a nat 20. You're off to a really good start. It only goes downhill from here. So if nobody is lost, I'm going to ask you to join me in an adventure. Pull out your nerd card. Figure out who you want to be in this world. <laughs> oh, there's our dry run. So in the game that we are playing right now, in like two seconds, you are going to be an adventurer. And of course, because this is kind of higher ed conference, we're going to be higher ed people. Um, you have a choice of being one of three people. You can be the all-powerful faculty member. I don't know if you have ever been a faculty member or have ever worked with faculty members. They seem to have an unending amount of time or at least they think they do. So in this game, they do. And as a faculty member, your secret power, your superpower is that you can manifest four hours once per game. Or you could be the graduate assistant. I'm sure we've all been there before as the person who's trying to keep that faculty member moving in the right direction. Graduate assistants are kind of tied in to the student body. So what I thought that their magic power would be that they can raise your star rating of the class by plus one star as their, their magic for the, for the game. Um, Cause you know, like rate your teacher, <laughs> grad students can sway that a little bit. The third role that you could possibly be is the instructional designer. Uh, instructional designers have the power of do-overs. They're really smart people. They find ways through everything. So as an instructional designer, if you roll the dice and you don't like something that you got, like poor Nina with her six, you could say, okay, I'm going to use my magic power for this one time in this game and I'm going to re-roll. So what we're going to do, have your d20 ready. Uh, we're already in like 900 tab territory. So, you know, this is, this is gonna be great. Choose your class. And when you've chosen your class, open your character sheet. It's right here. It's the second one. The first one will just allow you to open the sheet. The second one is going to ask you to make a copy when you click. So it'll say like, hey, do you wanna make a copy of this? And you click yes. The copy sheet, you're going to be able to edit. The view sheet, you're not. So if you are a view sheet kind of person, pull out a scrap sheet of paper um, so you can keep track. And what the character sheet looks like is right here. And I'm apparently already in this. I am already in, look at me with my 900 tabs. So here, <laughs> everybody has really cool names like the Time Warp and Friends in Low Places. Um, so here are the things so you don't forget about them. In your game, you have a few goals. Number one, don't run out of time. Everybody has a time that they have to meet. So you get five hours to complete your task and it'll make sense when you get in the game. Student rating, of course, we all know what happens when you get a, a one-star rating on anything. Nobody comes 
to your restaurant, nobody comes to your class. So you want something more than a one star rating. And you need three things in your inventory by the time you're done. It's the typical things that you need for a class. You need a syllabus, you need a schedule, and you need a textbook. Uh, as a lifelong teacher, I'm pretty sure I could run anything with those three things. So your three items in your inventory, you have a certain number of hours to get through and you need at least more than a one star rating. Once you have that going, our game and I'll throw our game. Uh, I can just copy it. Our game is going to be game link one. And I will throw the link to the game in the chat for those of you who want it in a different form. If you see TPL game number one and this fearless person running through papers with the sword, because that's exactly how I view teaching, you are ready to go. You can click start the course and get going. But before you do, and I know somebody has already clicked on it and is joyously going through this game, I have questions for you to consider. I know it's really fun to play, but the first question I really want you to think about is what about this is pulling your attention in? I know it's not my beautiful sounds of my voice, or I don't know if you can even see me right now joyously gesturing, but the joyous look of my face, what about this is pulling you in? The second question is what aspects of this game could be opportunities to encourage deeper dives in students? We all know that our students are hard pressed on time and attention a lot of times. What is it about this that you think could pull a student into maybe do a little research on their own? And then third, for my people who really love curriculum and course design, what similarities to online course design did you notice? So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna send you off on your first quest. When you are ready, you have eight minutes. I will see you all in eight minutes. <laughs> For those of you who just joined us, we are diving into a, what we call a branching narrative. It's a D&D &D game. There is a link. <laughs> Here's a link in the chat. I will get it for you right now. My brain is not going to work for me.
40. I never liked me. I ran out of time. <laughs> but I didn't use my reroll. You get a very big bag of D20s. One of them has to be nice. For those of you who failed miserably like I did, just warning, you have three minutes. You can play through a second time, see if you can do a little better than I did. I got a textbook and that was about it. <laughs> there also was a dragon you can talk to for those of you who did not go that route. For those of you just joining us, we are two minutes, <laughs> two minutes left on our timer, but here's access to the main sheet where everything is located. We're playing game one. Nope, you you are tracking this on your own, Andrea. It's a uh, it's the character sheet that is located. It's the second one down on that main sheet that's driving everything. So. I usually use a scrap sheet of paper. Um, I, I've probably played this game like 900 times now trying to make sure that it's balanced. <laughs> Hardly ever ends well for me. You'll just check it off on the, the character sheet Believe it or not, you all did something most people, most people that I've played with go straight for the, okay, I need inventory items. I'm going to go straight there first. There's a one minute warning. If you haven't finished yet, if you are still adventuring through, it's okay. Apparently people. Dragon's beating some people up today. Thirty seconds. <laughs> you know, sometimes an OER textbook is all you need. Ten seconds. 
Roll faster. All right. So let's deconstruct our experience. Our questions, which I have now officially lost. Oh, those are the directions. So what pulled your attention in? What was the cool thing that you noticed? What was the thing that drove you through? Looks like for some people, it was the dragon, the opportunity to actually talk to one. There was humor, it was fun. Institutional knowledge and nuance, engagement. The great creator, y'all are gonna make me blush. <laughs> having multiple pathways, the novelty of trying something new, the, the challenge of finding new ways to do things, the choices. And this is all, I mean, I didn't do anything new or novel. I just asked people to think a little bit about what we need in our class and how we can get it. There's no risk of failing in your own creativity. <laughs> uh, also, Adam, the first time our, our big boss, Melody, played it, all of her students left. Uh, it was a different version of the class where, or different version of the game where your students could just walk out on you. Uh, and she lost them all the risk of rolling so the chance of it all what aspects of this game do you think could encourage people to dive deeper so if you're thinking about this in an educational context and to give you all some background on how i've used something exactly like this in my instructional technology course my students are playing it professionals who need to create training for dunder mifflin paper company and they have to make different choices on how they're approaching something and so how could I use something like this in a, in a real class situation to encourage deeper dives? Those hyperlinks to unknown topics, exactly. Or even in just encouraging risk-taking, the hiding Easter eggs. I do this in my class all the time. I had a uh, Doctor Who class at another institution that if you could answer some very deep Doctor, <laughs> Doctor Who trivia, or you were a very good Googler, you could actually unlock bonus episodes, you could unlock games, you could unlock a study guide for the upcoming test. And yes, for those of you who didn't click around or play with the dragon, there are some really interesting articles that the dragon gives you. And what similarities to this did you see with online course design or even just general course design, besides the fact that you need to have a syllabus, a textbook, and a course schedule for most instances? This is always the hardest question. It's not straightforward, it never is. Oh, Sherry says none. Okay. Library at OER because free usually really gets students interested. So some of the things that Dungeons and Dragons brings, I love the unexpected. Some of the things that Dungeons and Dragons brings to the table that can really be harnessed in a, a course situation or in a teaching situation, any kind of teaching situation, is that element of collaborative storytelling. So where everybody is bringing their knowledge in and all of their knowledge has value. I, it's, it's giving value to experiences. So even just pulling out the questions of, you know, when was the last time that you noticed that plants did interesting things or with my instructional technology students, it was when was the last time that you tried to learn a new skill online and, and bringing in that collaborative storytelling. Yeah, I did that too. Or yeah, I noticed that too. Or oh man, that is bad. Another thing that Dungeons and Dragons or even role-playing games like this can do is helping people practice social skills. A lot of our disciplines involve 
social skills that really need a ton of practice and refinement. So getting in there and getting them to kind of practice not only what it means to be a, a person in your discipline or a person who's talking about something in your discipline, but also what does it mean to be a professional? What does it mean to actually interact with other people in an academic situation? We are teaching people to be cooperative. So how to work together with other people, how to have conversations. I, I was an English, a K-12 English teacher forever and teaching students how to have conversations about something that they care about or don't care about. It's a really important skill to learn. Uh, as you all have mentioned a ton of times, there's creative problem solving. There's even exploring identities and morality with role playing games and, and in D&D specifically, but in, in role playing games that you can play in your classroom. A lot of times we don't tend to dig deeply into things until we're forced to portray them. And so there's a really big role playing thing in higher education called reacting to the past where you take on the persona of different contesting identities or contesting groups and you really dive deeply into them so that way you can face the other side. D&D also offers a creative release and a social inlet and outlet. It creates opportunities for people to talk. So just so I don't get yelled at in chat, <laughs> um, this was not real Dungeons and Dragons. What you went through was actually called a branching narrative. They're being used in higher education and in actually a lot of different types of education as a form of play for students to go in and figure out what happens if. We're teaching them the best way to go through something, but for a lot of students, the question is there because they want to push boundaries a lot of times. My students always want to push boundaries because they're game study students, but what happens if I say this thing to somebody or what happens if I don't sterilize all my lab equipment? It's allowing them to explore and play and figure out the repercussions. Twine is another huge one. I actually, my goal was to rebuild this in Twine because uh, there is a ton of amazing resources out there with it. Um, and it's free. So next I wanted to run you through an escape room. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what escape rooms are, escape rooms are an immersive, I, I really hate calling it an adventure game because it kind of isn't, but kind of is. It's usually played in groups where you work together, but I've been designing solo escape rooms for a little while now. The whole purpose of it is to get somebody to investigate and solve problems and use knowledge they have and that they're gaining to solve these puzzles to get out of an enclosed space. Now I've seen them where you're trying to get out of a room, get out of a castle, you're trying to um, release something or not release something. I think you are, uh, in this one, you are trying to free a superhero from a villain's lair. There are lots of variations with escape rooms and your imagination can go wild with them. I've done them as timed things. I've done them with roles where somebody can do something a lot like what we did with the D&D thing where they can call in certain powers or randomly out of thin air, pull down some important information. Um, make them interact for information. As my, uh, as my freshman at NAU can tell you, I have made them interact with random people to get information where they have to go and talk to the librarian, not just walk into the library. Um, they didn't appreciate that one. They don't like talking to people. So game two is, of course, as you expect, going to be slightly different. It is going to be an escape room. You don't need to continue on with your, your character persona. You just need to find your way out. And so, uh, and before I show you the link, which most of you are incredibly, well, all of you are incredibly smart people. Um, but before I show you the link and everything else, the questions that I wanted you to consider with this one is how did your engagement change with this course or with this course, with this game? <laughs> how was this different than the last game? And what similarities are you noticing between this and course design or designing a teaching experience. So game two is right here, right underneath game one. I'm gonna copy it and throw it in here. For those of you who don't like clicking, I am gonna tell you, I haven't had anybody escape in the eight minutes. Um, 
So don't feel bad if you don't, it's totally fine. Um, but I'm gonna put eight minutes on the clock and I will awkwardly talk through the whole thing. So you have eight minutes. Oh, good luck on your meetings, y'all. Thank you for coming. Meanwhile, I'm going to see if I can escape. The sad thing is, I know the answers. We can't get into it. Uh, so, Sherry, do you see? Are, are you? Oh, double click on the research notes. Let's see if I can grab this for you really quick. I can remember how to do that. You need to trademark that. Competitive escape room anxiety is real. had suggested it as a fun thing to do with my coworkers, and I got a whole bunch of, nope, don't need that kind of anxiety in my life. <laughs> the game is on my screen. Do you need the link, Sherry? Nice, Stephen. One of my coworkers was talking. <laughs> One of my coworkers was talking about an escape room where you destroy things. Like you go in and you have to like actually smash windows and bust through walls. Like it's expected. Funny side note, Danielle, I did do audiobook recordings at the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> LibriVox is always looking for people who are willing to record audiobooks for free. I recorded a bird journal. 
it was really hard. I didn't know how to pronounce half the bird words. <laughs> I'm just going to apologize now. For those of you who need time reminders, there's about two minutes left. exact seconds left. One minute, 20, 25 seconds. <laughs> you know, I have some students who really want <laughs> exact time. I keep clicking around, so it's my fault. One minute remaining. Do, 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 do. Wait, that's Jeopardy, right? Oh, well. Do, do, do. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Yes. Uh, iPad's going to make it real challenging. <laughs> you have 20 seconds left. I'm so sorry you spent three minutes reading about toilet paper, Dan. Uh, but at least now you know. Uh, if you ever end up in a weird trivia night about toilet paper, you are prepared. And we're done. <laughs> so, uh, first, <laughs> first question. How did your engagement change in this game? Don't attempt on a tablet. That's definitely, and you know, Believe it or not, we I do try to give warnings. It just slipped my mind because I'm honestly real nervous. Um, but yes, these games really don't translate well to tablets. And I do warn my students before I throw them in. You wrote a lot more notes. This is probably the first time, especially since the beginning of the pandemic, um, that having multiple tabs open is enjoyable. What else changed about your engagement? Well, we had somebody reading about toilet paper. You got to listen to the first poem I have ever written since I graduated with my creative writing degree way back when MySpace was still a thing. Christy panicked. Oh no, we had somebody who couldn't connect to the game. <laughs> you know, engagement could be a synonym with blood pressure. Uh, levels of anxiety, stress, sweat, talk to yourself more. You know, sometimes you do need a, an expert's opinion. That's what I always say when I talk to myself. Oh no, security settings. I'm so sorry. 
I do. I wish I did have more time for y'all, but I wanted to make sure that I had a chance to talk about play. So a, a few things about this game. Um, I am not a graphic person. I, I do not draw well. So the handwriting that you see um, on the research notes that I now can't find. So this map, uh, as well as this is all my handwriting. I just wrote on an iPad screen and screenshot it <laughs> and uploaded it. Um, most of the, actually all of the technology I used was all free technology. Um, and when I created this, I had absolutely had my iPad for like two days and that's it. I, I have in the past drawn on a sheet of paper, taken a picture of it with my phone and uploaded it that way. So you have access um, to my planning table here. If you wanted to see how I planned everything out, don't if you want, it gives the answers. So spoiler alert, if you're past the answers and you just wanna be done, that's there. Um, the Padlet, again, like I, like you've probably noticed, I really love hiding resources. Instead of just giving you a gigantic list, I can reshare this link. Um, instead of giving you a gigantic list of uh, resources that I found helpful or that I found interesting over the years, you now get them in Padlet form. So you can do with them what you will. Um, so escape rooms, I have built out escape rooms with foreign language instructors, with um, science instructors, with math instructors, and they all take a little different turn, but a lot of them do tend to resolve, resolve, revolve around free technologies that are available and getting students to kind of connect the dots between the information that they have and the information that they're learning in the escape room. Um, so when we take a step back from Dungeons and Dragons and escape rooms and just encouraging play in our classrooms, there are some really big gaming, really big, there are gaming elements that are evident as we think about designing a course or designing a learning experience. And the first thing that always pops in my head is talking about the experience that you want to have. And the you here is the student. We don't know where our students are gonna go after they're done. And we don't even know what world we're releasing them into. Instructional technology has completely changed since the beginning of the pandemic and it's continuing to change. And the questions that we're asking ourselves and the way that we approach technology is changing. I can't prepare my students for next year, let alone four years from now when they graduate. And so allowing students to kind of choose the experience that they want to have can help them internalize the information that we're giving um, but also my specialty is faculty professional development and even just talking about the experiences that we've had and allowing people to kind of go through it the way that they want to and explore the, the areas that they want to. Some faculty members come to me and they really just want to learn about assessment and that's cool. Let them choose their path. Uh, gaming also creates narrative driven experiences. I've been telling you stories for the past 45 minutes. You've been telling me stories and we have a shared story that we have together with dragons and escape rooms and codes and toilet paper. That's really important in a classroom. And so gaming really allows you to pull in that narrative experience and you tell those narratives and your students tell those narratives. Bringing in an element of chance or surprise, like I've told you guys, I put in Easter eggs, I put in special access, it's, it's creating that I don't know what's gonna happen next feeling. And it doesn't even have to have a huge impact on your course. It could just be giving them extra materials. Um, and this is the big one. This is the, the next two. The development of expertise and the embracing of failure. Our students don't know how to fail, <laughs> um, but they also have a chance to dig into something and become an expert or feel like they're becoming an expert in something. So they might've just you know, started to dive in, but they're really bringing something to the table that allows them to put value in what they're learning. Um, this is probably my favorite slide I've ever created. So when we're talking about playing, we're talking about creating an environment where it's okay to make mistakes, 
my, your grade is not at stake. We're not gonna kick you out of this conference because you didn't get all three of your inventory items or because you didn't escape the escape room that is virtually impossible to do in eight minutes. Um, it's okay to make mistakes and it's fine. Nobody's judging you. And creating those opportunities in classrooms and what we're learning so that stu students can play. Almost, I thought I almost said children. Students can play and there's no repercussions to it. They are just figuring out how things work. And as we all know, the best learning is intrinsically motivated. And when we take away that fear of failure, we're creating lifelong learners in that there's no repercussions for what we're doing. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, if you need more reasons to incorporate a little bit of play into what you're doing, socialization is incredibly important. As you all have noticed, as we've been separated, social interaction is kind of a practiced skill that we we have to practice and to keep doing to be good at it. Uh, or else you end up awkward dancing, singing Jeopardy stuff in a conference. Um, it can decrease stress unless, of course, you have escape room stress, anxiety. Um, it can create a development of, of creativity. Creativity in math classes is way different than creativity in creative writing. It's way different than creativity in technology. And so we get into practice those different types of creativity that are so important for us to be successful later. Problem solving, uh, looking at yourself in a more positive way. Some students have never seen themselves as a good student allowing them to play and taking away the stigma of mistakes can really help those students begin to see themselves as intelligent, contributing members of society. And so you're probably asking yourself, how do you do this? The first thing I can tell you is start small. Uh, start with something little. Uh, I started out with escape rooms in my course by creating two question quizzes that release a game. And then I created three part puzzles and it gave them access to their homework early. Little minute things that students for some reason really enjoyed. I gave them access to a Doctor Who game. Uh, I'm, I gave my instructional technology students access to a project management game that they really loved. I don't understand, but I'm not judging. Um, find technology that is familiar to your students. I use Google quite a bit because Google's there and students are used to it. They've been using it since their K-12 days, they get it. Uh, find an objective that will, can be met by this game. If they're learning the very basics of something, it's probably not a good idea to turn it into a game yet if they have to have it mastered to build on something else. But in between, mastering new skills would be the perfect place. Create your story, get somebody else to create your story for you, ask your students to create the story, and then decide how they're going to interact with it. The biggest piece of advice I can give you is to be flexible. First games fail. As I, the story I told you earlier, our associate vice provost ended up getting kicked out of her class with no, or her students all walked out. Um, our assistant director of instructional design ended up running out of time and not getting any of her items. And so being flexible and figuring out how to fix things or knowing when to scrap it, if, if it just fails miserably, being able to walk away and having some backup really helps. So if you're sitting here thinking that you're not creative, um, you are, it's okay. We're all creative, <laughs> um, but think about your big questions. What are the things that caused you to dive in? Uh, for me, when I think about myself with Dungeons and Dragons and gaming, I was sitting at a table and I was like, why, why is this so fulfilling for me? Why are my students showing up at nine o'clock on a Tuesday night to play Dungeons and Dragons with me when they don't have to? It was an extra credit thing. So I had a question about how something could tie in and now I've started studying it. The big questions in your field, when I think about instructional technology, I think about you know what works, what doesn't work. Uh, there is no single answer here. Uh, some technology works in some situations, some work in others, and some don't work at all. So what are the big questions that exist in your field? And, and you're the expert, you know. So bring those questions out to your students. They don't have to get the right answer. It's, it's a big question. We're still figuring it out. And figure out how that big question ties into all the concepts that they're learning. This is always the one I get afterward. I get like approached by somebody who teaches like math 101. So, you know, introductory math and they're like, but I teach math 
or I teach, oh, uh, business ethics, which I was really surprised they saw that as boring. Um, when we engage our students, they see perceived value. So again, going back and thinking about what got you interested in this field? What got you interested in this topic? And what are the things that make people go, oh, wait a second, I didn't know that. And it's, it's capitalizing on those things. <laughs> and so what works for this, like what topics? I joke that everything does, but not everything, but you could really do a lot with gaming and game-based elements, even just creating spaces for play and for people to click around and share what they're learning. And the other question that I always get, but how do I find out what they thought or what they learned or if they even did it? Number one, students will always tell you. Um, they will out themselves 100% if they haven't done something. But ask them specific questions. What about this experience or what about this game surprised you? Um, you know, giving them access to something. So how did you, you know, how did you break this thing? What steps did you take? Asking them about the gameplay, even just looking for feedback, students will give it to you. My favorite that I always use with my, with my courses now is the assignment reflection. So I teach, or I used to, I don't anymore, um, but I used to teach a course called uh, <laughs> Utopia and Apocalypse Dreams. And it was 100% D&D based course where my students would play through a scenario that exists and they would work with their groups to try to save its post-apocalyptic America and they are trying to survive with their community. And so they're rolling dice and they're figuring out how to solve these problems. And at the end of the course, or at the end of the course, at the end of the day, their homework that they came back with was they had to talk about what happened and how things could have been different. They talk about overcoming dictators and feeding people when there's food scarcity and the effects of food scarcity and raising children. They, they cover the whole thing and they're digging in and figuring out the answers to this. And those reflections are gold for me because it shows me where the students are thinking and where they're learning. Another way you can do it is exit tickets. So asking students to turn something in like the passcode or like, you know, their one favorite thing that they did as a part of the D&D &D game or even just getting them to play through and talk about how many people survived or didn't survive whatever they were doing. So I just, I've been rambling for almost an hour. I wanted to stop and say, does anybody have any questions, cares, comments, contributions? I really wanna hear your voices. Thank you. Math problems do make really good puzzles and getting people to figure out how to, to do things with math problems, they're amazing. Thank you so much, Christy. I, this is probably my favorite thing to talk about. I don't get to talk about it very often. Yes, and, and like I said, almost everything that I use is, is free and you have links. Oh, sorry, I should say that before you all uh, go off into the wild blue yonder. There are, if you were interested in D&D, just as a person who's interested, there are links to Adventure Zone is my favorite. Critical Role, if you are interested in D&D, is probably the one thing that's bringing the most people to D&D now. Um, but there are links to websites and links to um, my D&D course that I was just talking about. So you could see the situations that students are put in and the handbook that they get. I give you links to the technology that I used. Um, I give you my email address. So if you <laughs> wanted to reach out to me, you have everything that you need. Twitter, I don't tend to post very often or check it, but it's there. Um, I'm going to make it a goal to do more Twittering. Um, and also if you have a dog that needs petted, I will, I will volunteer. Uh, <laughs> but yes, H5P is, is, is fantastic. I love using it. Um, and Samantha, I'm bummed that you were tardy too, but everything you need is here and there will be a recording for you going up soon. <laughs> I, uh, I'm allergic to cats, but I'll, I'll pet it and, and bear the consequences. Oh, Claire, there are um, some really interesting games for plant-based stuff. Um, 
There was one that was being, uh, that has been developed uh, talking about photosynthesis and the whole part of the game is trying to figure out how to get yourself as the tree, the most sunlight. And it can talk about decay and all, all, it was a really interesting game, but there are a ton of science-based, STEM-based board games happening. And that, if you are into designing games, that whole uh, venue is, is really hot right now. Like people want those kinds of games. And yeah, if you all ever want to share what you've done, please, I can, I can, I might need to create a, uh, a website for us all to share. Stay tuned. I also regularly update the sheet. So um, I knew, oh, I was just sitting here thinking I wish Brad were here. Brad is here and he is a huge board gamer. He knows so much. Um, and he just shared geniusgames.org. Uh, shout out to Brad. I, and I have my students create board games. Um, I was working with a faculty member who teaches paleontology, teaches dinosaurs. Um, and she really likes this game called Magic the Gathering. Um, it's a card-based game where you battle with cards, only she has her students create the cards that are dinosaurs and the dinosaurs battle to the death in her discussion boards. So the students all create the cards, she pulls two cards and their discussion that week is which one would win in a, in a death match. Or not exactly Magic the Gathering, but she was inspired by it. But they are creating magic cards with dinosaurs. So they put the stats on it and everything and they have to do the research. And so, you know, when you think about mythology, who would win in an epic death match? Zeus or Achilles? Achilles is not, I can't even, Venus? Aries, there we go. I was like, I know it's, it's somebody who moves fast. Um, but yeah, gods and heroes, or even like history battles, who if the politics of one person versus another were to go head to head on a certain topic, you can even do Cards Against Humanity style where they're, they have a question and they have to put down a concept or a person that they think would align to that. You're getting them to be creative and you're getting them to talk about things and it's not those same old boring discussions like the one I had to answer last night in my statistics course where there's only one right answer and we're all writing the same thing over and over again. And then we have to talk to each other about it. Like, yes, you're right because there's only one answer because the math is right. Sorry, did I show my distaste for discussion boards just then? <laughs> we have one minute le left. Any other questions, cares, concerns, comments, ideas? Now I really want to do like a technology battle in my next class. Who would win in a deathmatch and voice thread or play pause it? <laughs> then you would murder me. Well, fantastic. I have had so much fun this past hour. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have ideas and want to chat with somebody. Um, please feel free to reuse my materials. I don't care as long as we have more gaming in classrooms. It makes me so happy. Thank you all so much for sharing this past hour with me. <laughs> Game on. <laughs>